Ruto, hey, how's it going? Hey, John, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, thanks. So I'm, I'll introduce uh, Ruto here. Um, Ruto is, he's involved in, uh, with many excellent organizations and projects connected to participatory mapping, uh, including Digital Democracy, Earth Defenders Toolkit, Native Land Digital, uh, International Society for Participatory Mapping, and he's uh, here to tell us about one in particular called Terra Stories. So I'll pass it over to you, Ruto, and take it away. Great, thanks so much, John. And it's, uh, yeah, it's great to be here at Fuss for Good uh, to share with you a little bit um, about a tool called Terra Stories. Um, so first of all, my name is Ruto Kemper. Um, I'm with an organization called Digital Democracy. Um, our mission is to work in solidarity with marginalized communities to use technology to defend their rights. Um, we have kind of a dual approach in terms of how we do that, and this really runs throughout um, a lot of the sort of projects that I'm involved with, including Terra Stories, uh, which is um, a philosophy of co-creation, co-creating tools with local partners, and then direct support for local communities. And in so doing, we then also learn about the specific needs that are on the ground, which then inform the creation of the technology. Uh, so today, yeah, we'd love to tell you a little bit about a tool called Terra Stories. Um, which is a tool open source and free for mapping and safeguarding place-based stories. Um, it was co-designed and developed with a community called the Matawai uh, Maroons in Suriname and an organization called the Amazon Conservation Team. So I'd love to tell you a little bit about sort of the story of Terra Stories, how this all got started, and then I'll show you a little bit about the technology and how it works. So um, again, so this, um, the story of Terra Stories really goes back to a community called, and was inspired by a community called the Matawai Maroons in Suriname. Um, so Maroons and the Matawai are a community um, of um, Afro-descendant peoples that live in Suriname in the rainforest and have lived there for um, over three centuries. So um, the origins go back to the days of plantation colonies in the, um, the Dutch Guyanas, which, which is later became known as Suriname. Um, where these peoples escaped from the plantations over 300 years ago um, and settled there and continue to live there into the present day. So in 2015, um, the Matawai Maroons invited an organization called the Amazon Conservation Team to basically help make maps of their land. So um, at this time, there were a lot of threats that had started to sort of transpire in the Matawai territory, um, including small-scale gold mining. And so the Matawai wanted to have maps of their land to have a sense of where these threats were taking place in relation to their territory. And so um, ACT came in in 2015 to do um, some mapping there to help the community make maps of their land. Um, so initially that took place largely kind of in a workshop fashion, making paper maps. And what came out of that really was a lot of sort of knowledge of the landscape, right? So. Um, a lot of the elders were present at the workshops and were able to share a lot of their spatial knowledge of the lands, um, which was something really kind of amazing to see, you know, um, in terms of sort, of sort of the oral storytelling that came out about the landscape um, that really goes back to the first time that this community arrived in these lands over 300 years ago. So as the community was making these paper maps, um, there was a lot of storytelling and knowledge that came out. And it was really kind of amazing uh, for the team to see you know, the elders navigating the rivers in their minds and being able to identify both places and histories attached um, to a lot of these things that they were mapping. And this came out especially in the field context as well. Uh, when During several expeditions, you know, younger Matawai were traveling with some of the older Matawai and um, really hadn't heard a lot of these stories. So they were for the first time getting exposed to some of the knowledge that the elders had. In many cases, the younger people had not been around to hear those stories or had left to the city. And so for the very first time, we're getting exposed to a lot of this, um, this really incredible repository of knowledge that the elders had about, the, again, the first times that their ancestors first settled here, um, sacred sites that are considered sacred to them, historical sites where battles took place, and so on and so forth. And so um, in the duration of this project, um, this came out really strongly on a number of occasions. Um, so as a team was working to finalize these maps, you know, we uh, wanted to make sure that they were complete and that they were relatively comprehensive so that they could be overlaid with the kind of threats that were taking place in the landscape. Um, so there was one occasion where the team got the opportunity to sit down with the lady on the screen, whose name is Dora Flink, who was sort of identified as a storyteller, as somebody who had a lot of knowledge of the land. Um, in order to verify, in fact, the maps to make sure that they were relatively complete. 
And so uh, the team asked her a series of questions of, oh, well, we've heard of this place. Do you know where it's located? Um, and, you know, uh, she, had, she named a few um, places that she had heard of or that she knew of that weren't on the map yet. And upon hearing one name, you know, she really sort of lit up and started to kind of dwell into this memory of this place that she'd been to and when she was young and the stories about the place and started to tell us this really elaborate and amazing story um, about this sacred site, you know, and started to sort of sing and then take objects like a banana leaf that was nearby her uh, to illustrate, you know, the significance and the story, excuse me, the story of the place. Um, and this was something that really sort of dawned on the team of, you know, this importance of storytelling. So the maps were finished um, and were able to serve the need that the Matawai had, which was to have, again, sort of a tool to help them figure out where those threats were taking place um, relative to their ancestral lands. Um, but it really started, started this discussion internally within the community about the importance of story and specifically place-based story, right? Um, in terms of the oral histories that are related to a lot of the places on the map. And as, as geographers and cartographers, we really were just mapping the place names. But in the duration of this project, we realized there's something way more significant and important. And that's, again, the stories um, about the places. So um, Amazon Conservation Team, where I used to work, uh, where I worked at the time, started to do something a little bit different, inspired by this and sort of um, at the request of the community, which was to start to, re to record stories um, about the places. So this was a new project focused on oral histories where um, Amazon Conservation Team worked with the younger community members to make videos um, recording interviews with the elders that really focused on this knowledge. Um, this was quite an extensive project. It lasted about three years. Um, about 700 place names were mapped and 300 oral histories were recorded with 35 elders. This is a community of about a thousand people. So this was quite significant. Um, but we were left with this kind of dilemma, right, of how to connect to the maps that were produced uh, with the oral histories. And specifically because this is a community that resides in an offline context. This is in the Amazon rainforest in Suriname. And so either internet access is um, unavailable or it's very expensive. And so we wanted to do something to connect the maps with the recordings that the community had been making and specifically leveraging interactive maps. So, you know, we produced maps with kind of Nat Geo style had uh, text nearby places in order to orient people. And what you're seeing there is an example in English that were also produced in Matawai. Um, but we wanted to leverage interactive mapping technology to really bring the maps to life. Um, sort of thinking of more recent technologies like Google Earth and story maps uh, that are largely dependent um, on the internet access. So we started to kind of imagine, you know, what an application might look like um, that can serve this specific need. So we thought, of course, about interactive maps for stories. Um, very much inspired by digital democracy and the Mapeo software, uh, where there were a few other presentations, I think, this morning. Um, offline first design, right? Making sure that the application works entirely offline from the very outset. Um, we were really interested in, again, decolonial and local maps, so being able to have the community's own data on the map instead of something like OpenStreetMap, so a need for custom design. Um, data sovereignty and local access, so ensuring that the data resides locally, that the community has complete control over um, not only access, but also who is able to view stories and how they can, and, and sharing as well. Uh, free and open source, you know, as we started to sort of share this idea and attend conferences like Phosphor-G, um, we learned that there were similar needs all, everywhere across the globe. And so we wanted to provision something that's free and open source so that anybody can access it and tailor it to their needs as well. And we were really inspired by this principle um, of, you know, which is attributed to a Malian ethnologist. Um, when an elder dies, a library has burned down. So I didn't mention this with the community, you know, they don't have any record of the, like, that's been written down or recorded of their own knowledge. Um, so there's a real tremendous value in being able to safeguard and preserve some of that knowledge in the form of video recordings and maps. Um, and lastly, we wanted something that's fun to play with, you know, uh, we were really inspired by the younger people in the community that showed a lot of interest and enthusiasm about learning about the oral histories. And we wanted to create something that, you know, grade school kids would have fun playing with and in, in so doing would also um, have that experience of being able to hear these amazing stories of their elders. So out of that came this idea for this application called Terror Stories. And as we started to kind of imagine and dream of what this application could look like, um, you know, we had like very limited kind of web developer experiences. Um, I used to work a little bit with WordPress and Drupal. 
So uh, the initial um, version of Terra Stories kind of looked like this. I don't know if anybody recognizes the user interface, um, but this is essentially Drupal running Leaflet. And that was our first attempt at making this happen. Um, it worked. So this is only a dependent on online here. So we didn't get offline tiles working. And it was a pretty clunky application. Uh, Drupal comes with a lot of dependencies that aren't really relevant to this. So um, this is actually, I think, I don't think I've ever showed this before. This is the first version of what we, what, what later became Terra Stories, um, which, yeah, it did, didn't work very well. It was tricky to kind of customize. And we quickly realized that we needed something a little bit more customized and that there wasn't anything that we could find that's out of the box that we, that we could apply to this in the same way. So uh, we were pretty lucky to find a really wonderful collective called Ruby for Good, which is an open source uh, developer collective um, that organizes, well, first they organize kind of what they call build-a-thon events, um, you know, more commonly known as hackathons um, over the course of a weekend. But what's really great about this community is that they continue to be involved um, after the duration. So they really um, encourage folks to continue to work on projects. And so it, it starts kind of an active process of software development instead of something that finishes and ends. So we told them about Terra Stories and they were really inspired and excited by the idea. And so in 2018, Terra Stories was officially born uh, by this collective called Ruby for Good. And it started with a build-a-thon in Washington, DC, where uh, we worked with folks from Mapbox as well to try to imagine what this software might look like. And we got a really wonderful prototype at the end of one weekend where basically these are offline map tiles and then a very uh, basic UI on top of it and that connects stories with points on the map. Um, this was the very first prototype of it, but it later after um, you know, a few years started to look a little bit more like this, where the functionality is relatively straightforward, where you have an offline map tiles, and then you have basically a content management system that's built on top of the uh, map tiles where you can have stories. Um, when you click on points, you, it filters uh, the sidebar with the stories that are associated with that place. And you can also click on a story um, to be able to travel to where that place took place or where a story took place. And then there's also filters where you can filter the stories either by region or by indigenous taxonomies, as well as by um, the speaker. So if you only want to listen to stories by a certain speaker, uh, you can do that as well. And it will also filter the map content. Um, we had a lot of support by the uh, company Mapbox. Uh, this is Kalimar, my, my colleague on the left here. And we had kind of an MVP of wanting to deliver Terra Stories for the Matawai um, by a certain date in October of 2018. So Ma uh, Kalimar was able to travel uh, with me down to Suriname. And we had some really um, fun sort of jungle coding experiences on the right there, where basically Terra Stories was being hosted on a NUC on a small mini computer. And there was still some debugging we had to do. So uh, we had to actually wait until the village generator was turned on at 8, 8 o'clock PM. So the village generator only works for three hours. And we realized that we need some last minute changes. So we had to kind of work around the clock at nighttime, um, projecting Terra stories onto the screen, onto the wall there, as you can see, in order to kind of get it working for what we needed to do for a presentation the next day in the school in the Matawai community. So some very epic kind of jungle coding experiences uh, took place there. And then we were able to yeah, uh, share Terra Stories with the community, which was really just sort of um, exciting to see the younger, uh, the kids being sort of really um, inspired by this application and, and listening to the stories and being able to, for the very first time, actually hear some stories about places that are in their daily life, right? Like, so this is in a school and right behind the school, there's a river uh, that they basically swim in every single day after school. And there's a specific kind of granite rock there. And they, they jump off of that every single day. And we listened to a story about that granite rock where um, hundreds of years ago, you know, when somebody came to the Matawai community, they had to circle it three times and land at a very specific place in order to be recognized as friends, as welcome visitors, instead of somebody from the outside. And the kids were just like mind blown by the story because it's a part of their daily life, but they never realized that it had this kind of amazing significance. And, um, you know, the teachers uh, after this asked one of the kids to recount the story. And he just was able to tell the same story with a, a, an incredible amount of detail, which is really kind of inspiring to see. Um, like I said before, we built it to be kind of fun to play with. And so it is um, responsive design and it works on mobile. And so for the kids that are used to sort of playing games on their phones, it's something, you know, exciting to, to work with. Um, 
the, the school teachers really like it because it bundles a lot of things in one. So it's geography at the same time as it is like computer skills and language and history and geography. So um, the school teachers have really gravitated towards this as a tool to kind of really help the kids um, yeah, build capacities and learn and then also in a way that attaches to their life world, right, and their history. Um, since then, we've been really, really lucky that you know, we've had a lot of open source contributions. So Terra Stories is entirely volunteer built. Uh, we've only gotten funding on two occasions to build out small modules, but we've had over 70 contributions from the open source community. Uh, so we've grown quite a lot and um, been quite successful towards that end. And yeah, Terra Stories is now being used by a number of communities elsewhere in the world. So in the Jingu in Brazil, uh, there's an indigenous community called the Wauja, which is using Terra Stories uh, to map their um, um, oral histories about sacred sites in their area. And then it's also being used by a community called the Haudenosaunee, another indigenous community in Canada, um, who are using it to map traditional knowledge of rivers um, and overlaying that with sort of scientific data about river pollution in order to get a sense of how that, uh, where that pollution is taking place relative to their um, traditional sites. Um, we presented this at Indigenous Mapping Workshop last year, and there's a, there's a tutorial there as well, as well as a demo on the website that if you're interested in checking out Terra Stories and how it works, you can go to terrastories.io, and there's a demo there, and if I have time, I can also give a little demo of this website as well. Um, yeah, so since, you know, it's a technical audience here, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how the application is built. Um, so it's a progressive web app. Um, we're, in the future, we'd love for it to be a native app that can be installed, but right now it's a progressive web app. And the way that it works is that there's, um, it's, it's a Dockerized app with, which runs a Postgres database. Um, the CMS is basically uh, Ruby on Rails with React. And then the maps uh, can either serve, be served online, so via Mapbox or a different source um, in, for the communities that do want to use it online. Or in the case of an offline build, um, basically we use a software called Tile Server GL uh, that serves MB tiles. So you generate your MB tiles and your style JSON, and you feed that into Tile Server GL, and then that gets to be deployed offline. We were kind of inspired by Portable OpenStreetMap um, in the sense that you can set up a NUC, a mini computer that then generates a Wi-Fi hotspot through which other devices can access um, you know, the server. So we have a similar thing with Terra Stories where we have a workflow to set up uh, what we call field kits on mini computers where well, as soon as you turn it on it generates a hotspot and then anybody with their um, local device can access terra stories on there as well um yeah and then <laughs> i think i covered a lot of this already this is sort of like the current workflow in terms of how we you know get maps into terra stories it's a bit um involved still and we'd like to actually improve that and so if anybody has any thoughts on an easier workflow for us to serve offline map tiles, we'd be really interested in that. Um, right now, it's sort of like using Tippy Canoe to create MB tiles, and then later linking that up with a style JSON file um, that was curated and designed in Mapbox Studio. So very much uh, looking for ideas on how to improve that um, process. Yeah, so what's coming up next is uh, we're looking at a curriculum builder. This is about 80% finished. So this would be a feature within Terra Stories where you can curate your own stories. And this is, again, very much inspired by the teachers that are interested in Terra Stories. So currently, Terra Stories shows all of the stories that are on the map. And we'd love for folks to be able to make their own selection that will play in order. So today, we're only going to focus on these five stories, for example. Um, we're looking at more custom theming options. So right now you can change some features like the background image and some colors, but we'd like for it to do more. Um, custom orientation for the map in addition to north-south. A lot of the communities that are using Terra Stories have a different worldview and you know um, the way that their orientation is to the world can be different from north or south. Uh, coach marks to help orient the user on first load so that there's kind of a demo of what's going on before you get, before you get started with it and then a scene cue for stories that have been played, um, as well as audio for place name pronunciation, which was a request from a lot of the communities. And some things we're dreaming of is sharing between Terra Stories communities. So if you have two different communities that are using Terra Stories, how can, you, how can one community share a selection of those stories with another? We're looking at toggling between multiple maps, um, integration with Mapeo and other offline first tools, peer-to-peer uh, -peer syncing between different devices that have Terra Stories, and then just big picture, like pie in the sky dreaming is um, a mobile notification. So a mobile app that then also tells you when you're nearby a place. So
so that you can hear a story about it. Um, if you'd like to support Terra Stories, there's a number of different ways. You know, uh, it's entirely volunteer run, so uh, we'd love donations and sponsorship. And if you know of anybody that would be interested in funding this, that would be great. Um, but another way is just to get involved in coding. So we've been really successful with events like Hacktoberfest um, in the past where, you know, folks contribute uh, to various scoped out uh, pull requests. And so for this year's Hacktoberfest, if anybody's interested, we do have a bunch of tickets, including some map based ones. So if you're, you know, for example, like one is about adding uh, story po polygons and lines to the map in addition to place markers. So uh, it would be great to get some support if you're interested. And also helping steward Terra Story. So this is um, an entirely volunteer team. So there's a few folks that are kind of guiding and, and maintaining the direction of Terra Stories and thinking about the roadmap. So if you'd like to be involved in that, uh, that's definitely welcome too. And just lastly, I um, wanted to leave you with, you know, uh, if you're interested in the story of the Matawai, we did publish a story map um, on the subject, which is um, available online. Um, I can leave the URL in the chat, uh, Lands of Freedom, um, which is really, so the community after going through this long process of collecting oral histories and deciding on what they want to keep for themselves versus um, sharing with a broader audience, decided to put together the story map uh, because they didn't want to be put on the map and for the world to know that they exist. Um, so there's a really a, a amount of amazing oral histories of their land in terms of where they first settled and different battles that took place with the Dutch before they were able to, you know, uh, petition for their right to exist there. And so this is available online. And it in includes a number of quotes as well from the community kind of reflecting on this process that I think are really kind of key to, you know, the mission of Terror Stories and what we're trying to do with this. Uh, this took place at the archive, um, but when, when later we ended up going to an archive to gather some research materials that belong to the Matawai. But the quote, I think, is relevant as a whole uh, to Terror Stories as well. And so this is from uh, Tina Henke on the left here. Um, and she said, you know, these anthropologists wrote things down while my people back then couldn't write. But they told stories, and then the anthropologists recorded them. And now that the people aren't with us anymore, we should be able to find the story somewhere. And that is what we're doing now here at this archive. I tried to imagine how my ancestors lived back then, and that gives me a feeling to be a feeling of pride to be a Matawai, because it helps me to know my roots, and that really just kind of crystallizes, you know, why we built this application and um, why we decided to work with this community to be able to provide them with a repository of knowledge that they will be able to access into the future, and that their future ancestors will be able to benefit from as well. So um, yeah, just in closing, want to uh, give my gratitude to the Matawai for inspiring uh, the creation of Terror Stories and for continuing to uh, give us this motivation to continue to build this application and to share it with them. And that's what I had, but I think I have a little bit of time to also share you the application um, if you'd like to take a look at it. So this is, like I said, it's there's a demo at terrorstories.io. Um, and this is the main interface that you first see when you open Terra Story. So there's an option to translate it, and it can be localized and translated into any language. Um, so this is in the Matawai language. For this demo, we had an initial greeting in the Cree language. And when you enter it, um, as I said, there's kind of a map view as well as a sidebar. And when you click on one of the points on the map there, what it does is it filters uh, stories on the side. Um, you can also, like I said, click on one of the stories and it'll travel there. Then there's filters. So if we want to filter by type of place, it will filter both the map content and kind of pan to the maximum extent, as well as stories in the side. And one feature that's really important thinking about data sovereignty is the ability to protect and restrict stories. So, you know, there's an interface to log in both to edit and add content, as well as to view restricted content. So once you've logged in, um, what will become available to you are a series of stories that are um, restricted only to users with those credentials. So you can see that here, there's a little lock next to the story. So that was a story that didn't show up before um, because you didn't have the access to uh, when you only were signed in kind of as an anonymous user. So in that way, this is um, how we're protecting some of the stories. You know, the communities like the Matawai had a keen interest in being able to uh, have certain stories that there's only for their internal usage and some that they did want to share with a broader public. Um, so that's showing you some of the, yeah, restricted functionality there. Yeah, so with that, um, would love to take any questions and thanks for uh, 
giving uh, having this opportunity to share a little bit. Thanks, Rudo. Uh, fantastic! It's such a nice looking application, and it looks like you've had a lot of a uh, lot of interest in it from the communities you're working with. So well done. Um, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but I think we'll we'll squeeze a couple in here. So let's uh, let's jump into. It. So are you planning in some documentaries or other ways of spreading all this knowledge to the general public? Yeah, so on the, yeah, we did, uh, Amazon Conservation Team, the organization I mentioned I've worked with, the Matawai, did produce a documentary about the storytelling process. Um, it's about 10 minutes. It's on the TerraStories.io website where they really go into detail of um, what the storytelling and the recording in the field um, and the mapping looked like. So not so much the application itself, but it gives you a sense of, you know, um, what it looks like in the field. Yeah. Um. Okay, here's a, here's a question. How can we avoid this attracting more white first world tourists looking for ethnic photos that may be bad for those places? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I think that really goes to the point about data sovereignty and the community's ability to control, you know, what gets shared and what gets to be sort of maintained for personal uh, community use. So in the case of the Matawai, actually, they don't actually have an online version of Terra Stories. They have Terra Stories running offline in a couple of the sites and villages. And they did that by choice because they didn't really want to share any of this knowledge with a broader public. Besides the story map that I mentioned that I shared with you, um, their usage of Terra Stories is entirely um, offline. So there's a few other communities that do have it online. And I think that's an interesting question. And that really goes to the kind of the, um, the ability to limit what you want to share uh, versus you know what's for internal usage that's built into the application there as well. Yeah, OK. That makes sense. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question here. So uh, what areas and countries are you looking to expand and continue with Terra Stories? Yeah, so with Terra Stories, I think it, um, it hinges more on sort of requests and if communities are interested in using it rather than an act on our behalf of expanding. Mm -hmm. So um, all the communities that are using Terra Stories have requested to use it, right? And it's available as free and open source software. So anybody could really download it and use it and spin it up. Um, or use our online server. So there may be cases where, you know, for example, we heard about a community in Guyana that was interested in using it and they went ahead and installed it and that's great. And that's sort of the idea that we had behind it rather than kind of a proactive approach of expansion, you know, on our mm. part. Um, so it's available mm. for anybody that wants to use it. And um, yeah. Great approach. Well, I think we better leave it there. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Rudo, for sharing this with us and really appreciate your time. Great. Thanks so much, John. And thanks, everyone. Okay. Okay. Thanks. We'll see you.